Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show. Hey, Jai Picks, the other half of the show, the parlay. Joining me in to break down some UFC Vegas 71, Pavlovich versus Blades. Well, first of all, we got to recap UFC Kansas City. The boys were in attendance for the event. What'd you think of it? Man, it, there wasn't like an overwhelming amount of finishes by any means, but every single fight I felt like was fire. Um, from beginning to end, the first one, you know, a little bit boring, bad judging, but from then on, man, you got people getting dropped, getting back up, hanging in there, surviving rounds overall, such a fun card to be at. The atmosphere in Kansas city was insane. The crowd was rocking, uh, especially for some fighters that were from the Midwest, Clay Guida, Zach Cummins. And as always, everybody going crazy for Max Holloway, but, um, dude, I had so much fun. We had good seats. We saw every single fighter. I mean, we were within five feet of every single fighter as they were leaving the building. Ton of picture opportunities. Um, got to shake the hands of some good fighters. So overall, successful trip. Yeah, it was pretty sweet. And uh, the atmosphere in Kansas City was amazing. I mean, from the first fight, I was just talking about it um, with my dad earlier. I was telling him about the event, and it was like I went to Miami the week before that. And for the first fight in Miami, like there wasn't many people there. And then you go to the event the next week in Kansas city, the, it was a packed house for the first yeah. fight of the night in the prelims. When you're in Miami, the packed part of the stadium is up in the three hundreds and everyone <laughs> in the one hundreds, there's like nobody there. So you know who the true fans are and uh, the people that really want to see every fight. And at Kansas city, you could tell there was a lot of people there that really wanted to see every single fight, 14 fights on the card, obviously headline with Max Holloway getting it done. Five rounds, uh, unanimous decision there. Uh, not much to say about that one. I thought he, he looked really good. I expected that from Matt, uh, Max Holloway. Uh, I did think it was a little bit closer than um, maybe I was thinking. Like I, I thought Max would put a little bit more volume on him, a little bit more of a pace. But Arnold Allen was good for five rounds and didn't really look like he got enough going to really cement many rounds in, in that fight. It, we couldn't really score much of the fight because it's hard to to see you know where we're sitting and everything. So I'm not going to go through the scoring or anything. But obviously the the big mess up of the card was the the prelim, um, the first fight of the night. Lucy Pudilova, my girl Poodle, pay per view star Lucy Pudi, and uh, she didn't get the nod in a split decision. I thought she got the first two rounds. I think most people thought she got the first two rounds. Racked up the control time on the on the ground, got the takedowns, and uh, third round was closer on the feet, but I thought she probably lost it. I thought it was clear, 29-28 for Pootie. Didn't get it done. Uh, bad start to the, to the night for us because we both had bets on – you had one on, on uh, Lucy? I just had the under two – or over two and a half. Yeah, I was yeah, the only – I almost took Lucy. I had her by split or – or I had her by decision or submission. So that would have been a nice little cash to start off the night. Didn't happen, but overall, for the premium plays, uh, on the Instagram, I said I went up 1.9 units. If you add in the live bet that I gave out in the Discord, Bill Algio, money line minus 130. Uh, after the first round, then it would be up just a little bit over two units. So good weekend as far as that goes. Eight and one on the props again. So we stayed hot on the props and we are hitting at an unbelievable, unbelievable percentage. We're at like 84% on NHA and we just eclipsed, I think, 72% on prize picks. Swept the board on prize picks, four and one on NHA, eight and one in total. So staying hot in those, how'd it go for you? Yeah, up 0.35 units and I was a Billy Corintillo win away. From having a super, super good night. But man, it just being there live, I guess, it, you don't really, you're not, I mean, it's fun to sweat out the bets and everything, but being there live is just something else when you have money on the line. Um, and in that Billy Corntillo fight, man, he, you could see Edson Barbosa starting to get a little shaky legged. Um, I think if the fight gets past the first round, I think Billy Corntillo starts to up the pace and we start to see Edson Barboza start slowing down. So when he ate that knee, man, it was just heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking to see that. And, you know, watching the replay, he was trying to work back up to his feet. I think some people were saying early stoppage originally, I think pretty good stoppage. Cause he, you know, face planted off that knee. So overall 
I mean, probably good stoppage, but ah, you just wish he could have survived that and see what happened the rest of the fight. Um, but going back to Lucy Pudilova and uh, Jocelyn Edwards, man, and going back to your NHA props too, if you want to avoid the judges and getting robbed on these money line bets, NHA props are the way to go, and you're hitting at an incredible rate. So um, there's a little promo plug right there to to download the app and start getting on some of these at some of these props because you take the judges out of the equation. Um, another thing, coolest moment of the event for me was when Lucy Pudilova walked out first fight of the night, all you know, upset that she lost. I leaned over the railing because we were right there. And I said, you won that fight, Lucy. And who looked at me dead in the eye and shook his head and said, yeah, she did. John Cavanaugh. And I forgot that he was even her coach. So that was the coolest thing. Conor McGregor's coach, John Cavanaugh, looked at me dead in the eye and said, yep, she won that fight. So that was the coolest moment of the, of the uh, night for me. So shout out SBG Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Building. But to go off your, your Billy Q loss, that was the only prop we got wrong. And yeah. uh, then we had the over one and a half takedowns in that one. He started off the fight, shot a takedown right away. And I was, I was really happy because uh, it looked like he was going to go that route. But taking a knee in the first round is uh, never a good look to nah. any kind of over. So no, that was a perfectly timed knee by Edson, too. All props to him. Beautiful, beautiful knee. Um, any other highlights on that one? You had Brandon Roy Val with the knee. That was yeah. a nice knockout. Um, the the fight that we all wanted to see ended up to be an absolute banger. Zach Cummings <laughs> yeah. and Ed Herman. I I mean, that was probably the loudest the crowd was the entire night. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Like the crowd in Kansas City for Zach Cummins was loving it. And when he walked out, when he got his name announced, they were firing on all cylinders. When he knocked down Ed Herman like two or three times, like that crowd was roaring. Yep. And then he gets to finish with uh, less than a minute left. That was that was really fun to watch. Another highlight, Jillian Robertson getting the sub uh, in the second round. We had her as the free pick on the double leg, at the double leg on Instagram. So Get easy. Pick every week, and that was probably the easiest one uh, of the night. Minus 115, I believe, sub during the second round. Maybe a controversial stoppage, but I think she was oh, she was going to tap or, uh, or break it. So Yeah, yeah. That arm was toast, and... I had her by submission. I couldn't believe it was plus 260. I mean, I think you have to hammer that anytime Jillian Roberts is in the octagon and the submission props plus 260, hammer that. So uh, that was a fun one. That was a fun fight. She stopped by and took some pictures with us. Yep. Uh, said what's up. Um, Jillian. Shout yeah, out. man. Yeah. She loves the double leg. She's she's a fan. She is a big fan. She's of probably that. watching right now. Yep. Shout out to her. And then your big hit on the, the women's underdogs. The women's underdogs were coming through. I think what three fights, two of them came through. The only one that didn't was the one we, we picked, Julian. Yep. And easy Gomes getting the second round KO. You had her at plus money. How'd that feel? Oh, man. That was for being in that women's division. She holds some serious power, man. I mean, I, she wasn't supposed to win this fight. She was supposed to get outstruck and she landed that straight right. And I mean, uh, yeah, one of the best knockouts of the night that wasn't a knee for sure. And she, I mean, she was like plus 170, plus 160. I'll have to look. Um, but yeah, great cash nonetheless. She stopped and took some pictures too. I think we got pictures with all the winners that, that we had bets on. So yeah, I, um, would, I wouldn't take pictures with any fighter that took money from me. So <laughs> yeah. they, they made me lose my money. I was like, nah, you can keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little ruthless, but Bill Algio also getting a submission win. With that little weird promo saying that Kansas City was a dump, I honestly thought it was kind of weird. But as Colby, a too, it, yeah, a little too Colby Covington. I didn't really like it. Uh, Rafa Garcia decision win against Guida. Saw him at the airport the next day. He looked really tired, and uh, he looked like he had been through three rounds and landed like 150 strikes, which he did. <laughs> Pedro Munoz getting us. The uh, decision win as an underdog against Gutierrez. Kudalaba getting back on the track. Azamat Merzikhanov decision win over Dustin Jacoby. We were both uh, – well, I was on Dustin Jacoby for the money line, but you got – that's your boy. So uh, we were both really rooting for him. Yeah. And he didn't look like himself in that one. Just never really got going and didn't set any kind of pace. He, he was really just reacting to stuff. Didn't look yep. like he was too confident in there, which is not like him. So – yeah, he, one, uh, to watch there. Yeah, he just came on too late too. I mean, I don't think he realized how tired Azamat was, or he was just too tired himself to go for the kill. So, I mean, 
Mirzakhanov was up against the cage, almost keeled over, trying to catch his breath. He was super tired, and Jacoby shoots a double leg with a minute and a half left. So, yeah, just all around, not good to fight IQ last night uh, or the other night. And, uh, yeah, man, kind of sucks because he's, you know, people don't realize he's damn near 36 years old. So it's kind of, you know, now or never for him, and now it's two losses in a row. So, um, yeah, he just didn't look didn't look like himself. Yep, and um, supposedly Mirza kind of like broke his arm in the second mm-hmm. round or whatever, so you had him hurt. Um, but I will say, watching that fight, it looked like Jacoby was also very tired in the third yeah. round. So oh, yeah. He, he was probably uh, gassing as well. So that's about it for uh, UFC Kansas City. We will get into UFC Vegas 71 now. We got another Apex card, 13 fights on this one, headlined by Sergey Pavlovich and Curtis Blades. Start time is going to be 4 p.m. Eastern time, so we're not going to have to stay up too late this this weekend. And uh, first card in uh, almost a month for me that I'll be able to watch at my house. <laughs> I won't be on the road. I won't be at the Apex this weekend, so I'm kind of looking forward to chilling at the crib, watching some UFC fights. Got some good bell tour as well, and the, the boxing match between Tank and Ryan Garcia. But without any further ado, we'll get into the card. On the main event, heavyweight bout here: Sergey Pavlovich, Curtis Blades. Blades coming in as the favorite, minus one fifty-eight, plus one fifty-eight for Pavlovich. Over under one and a half rounds, plus one forty for the over, minus one forty for the under. As always, odds courtesy of Bet Openly, the best fight odds out there. BetOpenly.com, one percent juice, no house. So you're going to be betting against another person on the other line. 17 and 1 for Sergey Pavlovich, 17 and 3 for Curtis Blades. Blades' only losses are to two of the biggest power punchers in the division. Francis Ngannou twice and Derek Lewis once. And uh, you're getting Sergey Pavlovich in here who has a bunch of first round knockouts. 14 first round knockouts on his record, three decision wins and the one knockout loss to Alistair Overeem in his debut. So he's 5 and oh, in his last five and uh, five and one in the UFC coming off knockouts against Tai Tuvasa and Derek Lewis, which, you know, two guys that want to brawl and uh, two guys who have worn a bit of damage as of late. Curtis Blades last fight was against Tom Aspinall and Aspinall blew his knee out. So it's kind of hard to really look at him as of recently. I mean, it is win before that was Chris Dawkins, which doesn't age well. Jarzinho Rosenstrike uh, decision win, which is, is all right. And then a uh, loss to Derek Lewis. He got knocked out in the second round. So and this is, it's a very interesting matchup because it really is a guy that is just an absolute powerhouse might have some wrestling under his belt that he just doesn't really use because he, he's trained. At AKA before he's trained, he's training at American Top Team now, I believe. Um, and you got Curtis Blades, who's one of the best wrestlers in heavyweight history, gets takedowns like it's uh, it's easy for him. And then you got the cardio factor too. I mean, can Sergey just go out there and throw like a bunch of bombs and still be able to go into rounds two and three? Is he even going to come out that way? Is a lot of stuff you can look at in this fight and really dissect. But uh, what are you thinking? Right yeah, on. no, there's there's a lot of weird things going on with the line right now, too. Um, it looks like a ton of money is on Sergey Pavlovich from the jump, which is kind of surprising just because you look at who Sergey's fought and it's not really any wrestlers that are, you know, outstanding, any good at least. I mean, he's beaten Ty Tuivasa, Derek Lewis. Um, Shamil, Maurice Green, and Marcelo Gome, but nobody that's going to go out there and really give him that wrestling threat that Curtis Blades is going to. And we saw in that at the beginning of that Tom Aspinall fight. I know he got hurt early, but I mean Blades was cracking him, man. He looked good on the feet. I, I think if Curtis Blades can just hang in there and survive the initial onslaught, um, I think he's got a better chance as this fight goes on. I mean, Pavlovich doesn't really make it out of the first round, or at least he hasn't so far in the UFC and the one loss he has by uh, TKO came to Alistair Overeem who got that takedown and finished him in the first round. So obviously he's gotten better since then, you know, that's five fights ago, but um, 
everything I'm looking at right now, it just seems like Vegas thinks that Curtis Blades is a side that is probably going to sneak out the win because they're going to have to pay out a lot of money, a lot of plus money on Sergey Pavlovich if he ends up winning. Um, of course, he holds all that power. You know, we've seen him just absolutely dismantle people from the jump. But I, I just think Curtis Blades has that style that is going to make it a lot tougher to do that, especially when you're going to be worried about that, you know, that takedown um, threat right there from the beginning. And if you look at the line movement right now, Curtis Blades opened as a two to one favorite. Uh, he's all the way down to minus 155 on some books right now. Um, so if it keeps trending that way, I think if you're going to bet on Curtis Blade, you can kind of hold off till we get closer to the fight, and you might get a better price on him. I like Curtis Blades in this in this so far. Yeah, it, it scares me. Well, first of all, it tre- intrigues me at plus money for Sergey Plav- Pavlovich. You know, coming off of just some insane performances where you're you're looking at yourself like, wow, that that guy is scary. Like he's going to be a problem. And then. Uh, you know, seeing that Curtis Blades has, has lost to these big power punchers. Like, he hasn't really fared well against, you know, the best of the best as far as power goes. Um, most of his, his wins are to guys who have power but aren't, like, you know, one-hitter quitters. And maybe right. Pavlich isn't necessary because he, he just puts an onslaught on you. He, he gets in these brawls with, with Ty and with Derek Lewis where he just starts swinging – and he's like, I can swing harder and longer than you. Like, you can't touch me. I have this 84-inch reach. I can just stay at my distance and swing, and I'll hit you, and you're not going to hit me, which is exactly what happened in those two two fights. But if he's just going to come out swinging like that and be wild, Curtis can just level change and shoot a takedown because, you know, just avoid those shots at your face, level change, and get the takedown. We are in a smaller cage in the apex, so I think that favors Curtis Blades if he's going to you know want to push the takedowns and close the distance. Uh, but it really just comes down to Sergey's wrestling. Like, does he have good takedown defense? Most people haven't really shot on him. Um, the only guy that that really took him down was Alistair Overeem, and he landed a bomb from on top, and then yeah. just kind of folded him, melted him on the on the ground, and ultimately KO'd him on the ground. So that was five years ago. What's his maturity level like after that? Because, you know, you watch that fight. He landed a big bomb from the top, but it looked like once Sergei got hit from the top, he was like, all right, I'm out. Like, uh, I'm not dealing with this anymore. He wasn't, like, out cold or anything. He's just kind of, like, covering up. He's like, ah, I'm out of here. I don't think Blades is – like, Blades doesn't have any first-round finishes in the UFC other than Tom Aspinall blowing out his his knee. Yeah. So – he has solid striking. He has a good jab. It's nothing like too powerful on the feet. The thing that scares me is like he was on the feet with Aspinall. It was 15 seconds, but he was on the feet with Aspinall. He was on the feet with Chris Dawkins. For the most part, he was reluctant to push takedowns after takedowns against Jarzinho Rosenstrike. He stood and stand with him. Well, for a little bit, I, I fear that he's fallen in love with the feet because yeah. he didn't take down Derek Lewis at all. And maybe he just he's getting a little too comfortable on the feet. So if he doesn't come out aggressive enough, because you can't just start backing up on your feet against Sergei Pavlovich, he's just going to overpower you. So if he's comfortable on the feet and he doesn't push that wrestling right away and tire him out right away, then that scares me. You know, if you go, a minute in, two minutes in, where Sergey can get comfortable in there and start to get his hands going a little bit. So he's got to do it from the jump. He's got to just close the distance from the jump and don't give him any room to breathe at all. Will he do that? I think he could come out with that game plan and be very successful. I think if he's has any kind of brains, he comes out with that game plan and will be successful. So I'll take him there. I would maybe think a second or third round finish from Curtis Blades. But, you know, you're looking at odds. Plus 300 for Pavlovich first round KO. Like, why would you even take him on the money line? Take him plus 300 by KO in the first round. If he doesn't get in the first round, um, I mean, you're either taking plus money on Curtis Blades after he survives or 
you're getting plus, more plus money on Sergey Pavlovich after he's been on his back for a round. So yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the the way that I'll look at it. It's probably a good live betting spot. You know, you just take the plus money after the round. So I don't know. That's that's probably how I'll go about it. But for the sake of the show, I'll go with Curtis Blades. Um, I'm also holding a Pavlovich heavyweight champion by the end of 2023 ticket. So uh, if he wins, I'll be happy. So I might just take blades, you know, because if he wins, uh, I'll still have that ticket and it'll still be yep. live. So I'll take Brit blades for the sake of the show though. Got anything else? No, just that. I mean, finally a heavyweight fight that it could be yeah. you know, a lot of action, a lot of violence should be a lot of fun. At least what was it? I think the last heavyweight fight was like UFC 286 or something. It's been damn near a month. There was nothing on Kansas City, nothing on Miami, nothing on San Antonio as far as the heavyweight fights go. So finally getting them. You know, the division's getting small. But Middleweight bout here, Brad Tavares minus 160, Bruno Silva plus 160. Odds courtesy of Bet Openly as always. Over under two and a half rounds, plus 115 for the over, minus 115 for the under. 22-8, 22-8, and eight, Bruno Silva coming off the loss to Gerald Mearshart. Brad Tavares, 19-7, and 7, 35 years old. So a couple of vets here going at it. What do you like? No, it, it all comes down to which Bruno Silva is going to show up. I mean, he should have been able to put away Gerald Mearshart looking back at it now after Ger- Gerald Mearshart just lost by a knockout to Joe Pfeiffer because Bruno Silva has shown time and time again, he's got some serious power for the division. He's a crisp striker. He finds the chin. And uh, I mean, his power has been devastating in the past. And then he goes out there against Mearshart and, and just completely looked Mearshart. lost at times. Yeah. You heard me. <laughs> Mearshart. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I just, he looked like something was wrong in that last fight. I don't recall him saying he had any injuries or anything like that, but he goes out there like, looks like that against Brad Tavares. I mean, Brad Tavares is a, a strong dude who's holds some power too. And he's only fought pretty damn good fighters in his recent fights. So um, Bruno Silva is going to have to be on his A game. If he does come out there and looks better um, than he has been, he's got a chance to knock out uh, Brad Tavares in my opinion. But if he doesn't, I think he gets eaten alive here. And it's just all going to come down to which Bruno Silva, Silva we get here. Yeah, I mean, Bruto Silva is the only guy to go to a decision with Alex Pereira. And he lost that fight, but put up a pretty solid fight. And that's, I think, that's a lot why uh, people were high on him going into the Mearshart fight. And that's probably why he got that respect from the books. He was like minus 300. Yeah. And maybe he just wasn't expecting that from Gerald. But we all know Gerald can put on a good performance on any given night. And he's a live dog always. But Brad Tavares, he's pretty tested. I mean, he's been around for a while. He had that fight with with Izzy, which was you know, respectable. He went to decision with him. Then he had the loss to Edmund Shabazian when he got knocked out with the head kick. And then a couple wins by decision against Antonio Carlos Jr. and Omari Akhmedov, who's now in PFL. And then the loss to Drakus, where he kind of got pieced up. Like, yeah, he had a solid first round against him. And then Drakus just pieced him up for the next two rounds and, and won the fight. 60 significant strikes absorbed in the third round, 39 in the second round. Um, A bloody fight there. But at this point, like, I'm looking at this fight like it's probably dog or pass. Like, Tavares tra- trains out of extreme victory. You know he's going to come in with a solid game plan, but are the skills there to really, you know, get it done, to, to implement it? Bruno Silva, he's got a bunch of knockouts on his record. I think it's what, like 19, 20 um, in total. And then uh, he's never been knocked out. So, you know, he's going to be there, but he's got a bunch of submission losses, six under his record. Not great. Not great. So this is probably going to be a stand-up battle. I don't see Brad Tavares really shooting too much. He doesn't average. He only averages less than one takedown uh, per 15 minutes. So. It's it's a standing battle. One guy's got really good KO power. One guy a little bit more, you know, seasoned in the UFC. He's got a little bit better fights under his record. Stands and uh, throws the volume a little bit more. But Bruno's got that knockout power. And as a dog, I kind of like it. 
I'm, I'm probably going to go dog or pass in this one. For the sake of the show, I'll take it for the pick, Bruno Silva. Um, but, yeah, maybe Bruno Silva by knockout would be a, a c- decent prop looking uh, throughout the week. But for the sake of the show, I'll take him. Lightweight bout Bobby Green back in action against Jared Green or Jared Gordon. Plus 230 for Jared Gordon, minus 230 for Bobby Green. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 250 for the over, plus 250 for the under. Bobby Green, very seasoned 29, 14, and one. Jared Gordon, 19 and six. Both guys in their mid 30s. Bobby Green, obviously, coming off a couple of losses to Drew Dober and Islam Makachev. Uh, Jared Gordon coming off the loss to Patty Pimblet, which a lot of people didn't think he lost. So he's coming in as a, a sizable underdog again. So maybe there's a little bit uh, that you can take from that Patty Pimblet fight. Maybe you look at that and say Patty Pimblet wasn't isn't that good, or maybe you look at it and say. Okay, George Jared Gordon can hang with you know one of the, the better guys and possibly win that fight. So personally, I don't think Patty Pimblett is that good. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Bobby Green in this one. I think Bobby Green, this is probably a stand-up fight. I don't think Jared Gordon really is gonna look to take him down that much. Bobby Green has solid takedown defense as it is, 72% uh in his career, which is solid. It's not like anything crazy, but he pushes a pace with that volume. And I think if it's a stand-up battle, Bobby Green's just going to be able to put the pace on him and land some solid shots. Jared Gordon doesn't have big knockout power. Uh, I mean, he cracked Patty Pimblett with a couple left hands. Um, he just doesn't have a lot of a lot of finishing power under, under his belt. So it's probably a 15-minute fight. Bobby Green is going to get the better of the exchanges and uh, put the pace on him, rack up the volume. And get a dub probably by decision uh, because Jared Green's got a decent chin. He's been knocked out a couple times. But Bobby Green, we all know, is not a a big, massive uh, puncher. So I'll take him by decision. What do you got? Yeah, I honestly think this is all Bobby Green here. And I think people are going to fall into that trap of seeing Jared Gordon as plus 210 after arguably beating Patty Pimblett. But, I mean, at the same time, you look at Patty's style compared to Bobby Green, and he can't hold a candle to Bobby Green's defensive striking. I mean, Bobby Green's head movement, I know he got knocked out by Drew Dober, but let's be real, Drew Dober and Jared Gordon are on different levels. And and Jared Gordon did crack Patty a few times, but it's with that overhand right. And if Bobby Green's getting caught with overhand rights at this stage in his career after being such a good and slick boxer, maybe he's lost a step and it's time to think about hanging him up. But... Um, Jared Gordon's got one path to victory and he's got to get the wrestling going and he's got to do what he did to Patty and uh, hope the judges give it to him this time around. However, Bobby Green's got good wrestling too. So um, I I think that's kind of going to offset it and it's going to keep this thing on the feet. And if it's, if it's on the feet, the whole 15 minutes, this is just Bobby Green doing what he does with the jab, triple jab, tripling up on the jabs and just piecing guys up. I don't think he necessarily knocks Jared Gordon out. I think this thing goes to a decision. Um, but I think Bobby Green's going to land a ridiculous amount of significant strikes. Jared Gordon might catch Bobby a few times with you know a decent shot here or there, but the volume alone on the feet is just going to be overwhelming for Gordon, in my opinion. Um, so you, you see that, though. He plus 210, and you're like, man, that's a great spot. Um, you know, Coming off of a fight that he should have got his hand raised against the guy, one of the guys with the biggest hype in the UFC. But uh, this is another, another spot where you know Bobby Green's minus – over minus 200 right now, and I think rightfully so. I think he gets a pretty easy win here. Yeah, I mean, he he standed and struck with Rafael Fazif. I mean, yeah, yeah. Almost 40 more significant strikes. Granted, he lost. He doubled up Tiago Moises. Granted, he lost. But, like, he's putting up some good striking performance uh, against solid competition, and he's coming off yeah. two losses. Uh, so, you know, you're probably getting a, a better price on him, even at minus 230, like, yeah, uh, Jared Gordon doesn't have any like notable wins in the UFC, and I just can't really get behind. I mean, plus two thirty is tempting. Of course, it's it's gonna look tempting, especially after being in that spotlight. But like you said, it's probably a, a cruise to a decision for Bobby Green. 
Strawway bout, Yasmin Lucindo. I think that's how you say it. Brogan Walker, plus 280 for Brogan Walker, minus 280 for Lucindo. Over under, two and a half rounds, minus 240 for the over, plus 240 for the under. Brogan Walker coming in at seven and three. Yasmin Lucindo coming in at 13 and five, 21 years old. So this chick has been around the block and she started her pro career in 2017. So if you do the math, that was six years ago. She was 15 years old when she became pro. And uh, she had a, a great fight in her debut against Yasmin Yaraguay, who I think yeah. very highly of. And she looks right at home. I mean, she won one of the rounds on uh, a couple of the judges' scorecards. She looked like she belonged in there. And she looked like she's all action. So she's getting a lot of respect coming in here at minus 280 against Brogan Walker, who I have to say is has fought some solid competition, like not even in the UFC. She's fought Aaron Blanchfield in Invicta. She fought Pearl Gonzalez in Invicta. She fought Miranda Maverick, beat Ma Miranda Maverick in Invicta, and then comes on to the Ultimate Fighter, gets a couple wins, fights for the Ultimate Fighter Championship against Juliana Miller, our girl, Juliana Miller. <laughs> And uh, she gets the shit beat out of her, really. I mean, she got taken down four times when she was on the ground. Miller was landing ground and pound. And she ultimately got finished in the third round with, with the elbows from the top. So not a good showing in the Ultimate Fighter Championship. <sighs> but, man, I mean, we all know women's MMA. And uh, you're looking at a, a seasoned – I mean, she only has 10 fights. But, like, she's 33. She's fought really good competition even outside the, the UFC. And you're giving her a girl who had a good debut. She lost, but she's only 21. Like, yeah. fuck, man. Like, how could I get behind minus 280 for Lucindo? I mean, I know Walker just lost to Miller. This is MMA math. Like, women's MMA math is the worst. Like, yeah. we yeah. think MMA math doesn't, like, work out. Don't look at women's MMA math because that is just never <laughs> fucking works. Never. So, yeah, I look at this and I think I, I can't lay the chalk on Lucindo. I'm sorry. Like, I, just based on what we've seen, let's just say it goes to a decision, right? And you're holding a minus 280 ticket on Lucindo and it's a split decision and Brogan Walker gets that, that, that knot. You're going to be feeling really shitty about yourself for playing minus 280 on Yasby and Lucindo. And this fight probably goes to decision. That's what the odds are saying. So if it goes to decision, I probably want uh, you know, the plus money on Brogan Walker. Now, I'm not saying that she wins, but you know this is a betting show. And uh, we're looking at the odds. I don't think I can get behind Lucindo at minus 280. I think she's probably beats her on the feet. Um, Brogan Walker struggles off of her back if she gets taken down. Lucindo hasn't really shown that she's going to do that. So this is probably a stand-up battle, and this is women's MMA. So beware. Buyer beware on minus 280 of Yasmin Lucindo. Uh, I do think she wins, but, you know, it's just what we've seen. Don't like it. Don't like that it's that way either. I don't like it that uh, we have to think that way. But we are betters, and we have to think that way. So that's how we're going to take it. What do you got? Yeah, no, I, I think Lucindo wins too. Um, but from a betting standpoint, man, it's just too early to have anything on her, in my opinion. I think you have to pass on this fight. You know, you, we saw her against um, Uragui and looked pretty good. Kind of got outstruck the whole fight, but uh, I think that was kind of to be expected. Um, but man, being 21 years old and a minus 280 favorite just doesn't mix well with me. And even though Brogan Walker is not the most experienced mixed martial artist for being, what is she, 35? Um, so, yeah, and losing a Juliana Miller obviously ages horribly right now, especially getting TKO'd. I mean, we know Juliana Miller has a good ground game when she gets it there and she got on top and, and, you know, Brogan Walker couldn't do anything about it, but Lucindo, you're either going to see the 21 year old be faster and crisper on the feet than Brogan Walker, or you're going to see Lucindo uh, maybe fade as the fight goes on and Brogan Walker staying calm, you know, gets this fight where she wants it and we get a sketchy decision, but, and right now, it's just too risky bet on a 21-year-old at minus 280 uh, in a fight that's probably going to go the distance. So, uh, yeah, I got to lay off for the pick. I think Lucinda wins, but confidence level not real, real high. You know what? 
Rogan Walker struggles off of her back in the grappling, but you know, watching her in Invicta, she doesn't have a bad like offensive grappling game. So Lucindo, 21 years old, she doesn't have a great grappling game. I mean, she's been submitted three times already. Yeah. And you know, if you're Rogan Walker, you probably don't want to stand at strike with her because she's got some pretty good hands. Right. Maybe you go to that grappling, and that's where it gets greasy. So, yeah, a hard pass for me on uh, that one. Maybe we're going to sprinkle a little on Walker and just, you know, hope for the best, but we'll see. Jeremiah Wells, Matt Semmelsberger in a welterweight bout here. Even odds for both guys, plus 100. Either way, if you're one and wondering how that is, it's because it's bet openly and you're taking one side, yes, and somebody else is taking the other side. Over under. One and a half rounds, minus 140 for the over, plus 140 for the under. Semmelsberger coming in here off of a, a big win in which you called in uh, our show back in December against Jake Matthews, where he was a plus 240 underdog, and you called that one. Uh, he had a loss to Alex Morona before that. And then uh, Jeremiah Wells, a couple of knockout wins. A uh, uh, knockout winner over Court McGee last June and a submission win over Blood Diamond last February. So he's coming in here 3-0 and in the UFC, and he is, what, 36 years old? The guy's an absolute muscle hamster. Like, Jesus, my mm -hmm. guy. My guy is is not juiced as in the bad kind of juice, but he <laughs> he's, he's bricked up, man. And uh, Matt Samuelsberger, a big welterweight as well. What are you thinking in this one? I'm kind of thrown off i'm not gonna lie what do you yeah think? no it is a tough it, it's kind of hard to gauge which way this fight's gonna go because you look at jeremiah wells submits blood diamond who is a kickboxer with not much of a ground game so um and then he goes out there and he knocks out a near 40 year old court mcgee but on simmelsberger's side i think he was everybody thought he was gonna lose to jake matthews and i think everybody was so high on jake matthews because of his fight with andre fialo you know knocked him out People are thinking, okay, Simmelsberger screwed here. But, man, you watch Simmelsberger fight, and he can kind of do it all. He's got heavy, heavy hands, as we saw against Jake Matthews. I mean, he was cracking them, dropping them every which way. And he's tough as nails, too. So, um, you know, Jeremiah Wells obviously has looked really, really good. But you just got to look at who it's against and what he's doing to guys that um, don't necessarily have, you know, a ground game like Blood Diamond and guys who are, you know, 40, almost 40 years old and been in the game for a while like Court McGee. So it's just hard to gauge for me what type of fight we're going to get because Simmelsberger, we, we've seen to be proven. Um, he's fought good guys. He's lost some. He's won some great fights. He holds that power. And uh, I think if he can just kind of stretch this fight out a little bit, I think he's got a better chance. Jeremiah Wells is going to be live early. But uh, this is going to be Jeremiah Wells' first true test against a, a legit fighter, in my opinion, in Simmelsberger. It's kind of hard to get off the Simmelsberger train for me because that was a sweet victory at plus 240. Um, but again, from a betting standpoint, I just haven't really seen enough from Jeremiah Wells at this level against actual guys like Simmelsberger. So right now, I have to, I have to stick with Simmelsberger for the pick. Won't be surprised if Jeremiah Wells figures out a way to finish the fight. But uh, for right now, yeah, I'm going to go with Matthew Simmelsberger. Your boy, Semi the Jedi. Um, yeah, this is tough, man. I mean, I've been a believer in Jeremiah Wells. I mean, he got into the UFC kind of late. I mean, he's 36. It's now or never, man. Yeah. Got to go for it. And Semmelsberger being 30, he's got a, a more UFC fights under his record. Basically, he holds a lot of power in his shots. Um, but it seems like if you can stay safe with them and just out volume them, you can beat them. That's how Alex Morono beat him. That's how Chaos Williams beat him. And then uh, against Jake Matthews, he just kept catching Jake Matthews and knocking him down. Three knockdowns in that fight. And uh, somehow got a 29-28 on two of the judges' scorecards, yeah. <laughs> um, which is interesting. He had a knockdown in every, every round. So very interesting there. Um, and then Jeremiah Wells. <sighs> It's it's really tough to judge. Like like you said, I mean, not a ton of tape out there because he's second round finish, first round finish, first round finish, uh, as far as the UFC caliber competition goes. And he's got, he possesses massive power. There's no doubt about that. 
Um, so, you know, at a 50-50 a fight, you're basically betting on um, some type of finish as from Jeremiah Wells or a, a Semmelsberger. Could finish him, could get a decision win, could take him down. Jeremiah Wells seems like he has, has really solid jiu-jitsu if he wants to use it. Um, an interesting fight, I, I would say that. Probably something I won't get too invested in for the sake of the show. I'll go with Jeremiah Wells just to be on the opposite side of you. Um, <laughs> and I think he possesses a little bit more urgency as far as his career goes. Uh, he's tra training out of camp, Hensel Gracie, Philly in uh, Philadelphia that uh, I, I like because that's the, the Sean Brady and Joe Pfeiffer camp. So I think Joey P is going to be cornering him there. Um, yeah, I'll go with him. I mean, there's not a lot to go off of, uh, but I think maybe he, he possesses a little bit more finishing ability. And if it goes to the ground, I think we could be, you know, looking at, at Jeremiah Wells like a problem there. So I'll take yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I, I want to see what he looks like past round one. I mean, I know he got the early finish in round two in his debut, but Man, maybe this is a live bet situation for Simmelsberger if he survives that first round. I mean, how's all that muscle going to hold up after you're, you know, right. you go balls to the wall in that first round? And Simmelsberger's been there before, man. He's been in wars. So, um, yeah, interesting. I, I, I'd like to see what what Jeremiah Wells looks like after that first minute in the second round. And if he doesn't look that good, I think you hammer Simmelsberger on the live odds. Yeah, you're right. Because uh, Simmelsberger against AJ Fletcher, Fletcher. I mean, definitely won the first round against them, and then Summersberger came back in the second and third. Yeah, got the, got the win. So, yeah, probably a good bet, live betting spot there. Good call. A lightweight bout: Ricky Glenn sitting at the favorite minus one hundred and sixty-two, and Chris Dos Yagos plus one hundred and sixty-two. Over under two and a half rounds, minus one hundred and fifty-five for the over, plus one hundred and fifty-five for the under. Ricky Glenn coming in here after a bit of a layoff. Uh, his last fight in the UFC was against Grant Dawson in October of 2021, uh, which he went to a draw with Grant Dawson and then uh, a win over Joaquin Silva earlier in 2021. Christos Yagos. I got to say, I mean, he's five and six in the UFC, but his five losses in the UFC are Tiago Moises, Armin Sarukian, Drakkar Kalos, Charles Oliveira. That's four of his five. Um, within his second stint in the UFC. He was with the UFC, got caught in 2015, and then came back in 2018 against Charles Oliveira. So his losses are to pretty respectable dudes. Um, but to go off of that, he is like, I think he's one and six in the UFC as, as an underdog. Um, yeah, he, every time he's been an underdog, he's lost except once, and that was against Dabir Hadzovic, who we all know cannot grapple. So the odds are stacked against him here against Ricky Glenn. Honestly, I can't say I'm too confident in the odd, the favorite, Ricky Glenn, considering the circumstances and him being 34. Um, but I don't know. Maybe you got a better read on this one. What do you think? No, not really. Just that, I mean, you look at uh, Chris. Sorry, I went to the wrong page. Christos's record. You mentioned, you know, all the losses he has against these guys like Charles Oliveira, Tiago Moises, and uh, even Armin Sarukian. But the wins he has aren't really over guys that you know have fared too well in the UFC. He's yet to beat that big name guy. Um, I think he's got to wrestle in this fight, and if he can't, I don't think he's gonna exactly fair too well in this one it is kind of hard to get a read though um ricky glenn you look at his his output it's decent he throws over four significant strikes per minute um for him though he's got to keep this thing on the feet because if you go back to chris doses he's got a negative strike differential and he wants to get the takedown so it all comes down to where this fight is going to take place if it's on the feet i'm with ricky glenn all day if it's not um, you got to be on the other side, but for the sake of the pick, I think Rick, Ricky Glenn gets it done. I do think he's going to have that takedown defense. Um, it's right around 70% at this stage. I think it's going to be good enough to, to stuff some takedowns and, uh, yeah, give me Ricky Glenn on the feet. I don't think he gets the KO, but, uh, I think 
I'm going to call 29-28 on the judges' scorecard. I think maybe Christos has one round where he does have some success in the grappling, but other than that, I think it's all Ricky Glenn. Yeah, I think if Yagos wants to have a shot in this fight, he's got to go for the takedowns. Because uh, watching him on the feet, he's not like – he leaves a lot of openings on the feet, and he, they have been exposed uh, when he fights these high-level guys. So he got knocked out by Sarukian. Uh, he's, he's gotten – hit clean by other guys as well. So, I mean, Ricky Glenn will find the openings. If Christos wants to win this fight, I think he's got to push the wrestling. Ricky Glenn struggled with that against Grant Dawson. Uh, gave up eight minutes of control time on the ground. So, uh, it's if Yagos can get it to the ground, he's, that's his chance. Um, yeah. I'm going to guess. I, personally, I think it's dog or pass. Like, I, I'm not getting behind Ricky Glenn at this price. Uh, maybe I change my mind throughout the the week, but as of now, I just can't go. I can't do it. Um, so, for the sake of the show, I'll take the dog. The Chris. one interesting thing is that there is nearly 65 percent of the money on Giagos at uh, plus 150 right now. So the line's not. Ex- it looks like there's been some big bets come in on him, though. Um, I mean, only 24 percent of the bets. Are on him and uh, 65% of the money. So it's kind of interesting. We'll see what happens with the line as the week goes on. I think it could get a little little closer based off that alone. Yeah, one to keep your eye on. Smaller cage, too. So yep. Bantamweight bout the biggest favorite on the card. Montel Jackson, minus 495. Ronnie Yaya, plus 495. Over, under, two and a half rounds, plus 130 for the over, minus 130. Or the under 38 year old Ronnie Yaya coming in here, three one and one in his last five, still doing the damn thing. Montel Jackson, 30 years old, 12 and two, four and four and one in his last five, just got the win uh, at MSG against Julio Orche. Who do you got in this one? I think it's all Montel Jackson, especially with Yaya being you know a little bit older. Jackson, pretty damn good wherever this thing goes. Uh, you look at he's got. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine UFC fights, and he's only been hit with 1.4 significant strike per minute, which is pretty good. I don't even think he's, he's not going to have to worry about that in this fight anyways, but it just shows you how good and how you know understanding he is of the striking game. Mix that in with the offensive wrestling game himself and, and a decent takedown defense. I just don't see... Ronnie Yaya giving him much trouble, especially being, you know, 38 years old. I think I think Jackson is a good fighter. I think he's going to get a big win here. Um, keep climbing. He's on a three-fight win streak. But, I mean, Ronnie Yaya, what's that really even do for your career at this point? I mean, I don't know why. I, I know he wants to fight, and that's probably who they offered him. But, I mean, you beat Ronnie Yaya here. You got to start fighting up the ladder a little bit, in my opinion. But I do think it's all Montel Jackson here. Yeah, I mean, he's a massive 135-er. He's big. Uh, you look at the guys that have a frame, uh, 5'10", 75-inch reach. And then you look at Ryan Yaya, 5'6", 67-inch reach. So he's probably going to be looking pretty small compared to Montel Jackson. Uh, and if you look at the guys in the cage, you'd be like, all right, Montel, you can, <laughs> can go after this guy or you can just sit at range and pick him apart. But I will say this. When I look at Montel Jackson, at you know minus five hundred favorite, and I look at the ways that he's lost, he has lost to Brett Johns and Ricky Simone in the UFC. Those are his only two losses in his career. The reason he lost those fights is the guys were taking him down, and I don't think Montel really likes to be on his back. So yeah. I'm looking at this like Ronnie Yaya averages almost three takedowns per fifteen minutes. You know, granted, he's 38 years old, but I mean, he's still getting them as of recently. His last fight was in November of 2021 against Chung Ho Kong. He got three takedowns, won that fight by decision. Fight before that was in March 2021, got two takedowns, won that fight with an arm triangle. Now, are those guys Montel Jackson? Probably not. Um, but then he just looked like Ronnie Yaya wants to get it to the ground. And if he can get Montel Jackson on his back, he has some pretty good top pressure. Maybe yeah. he won't be able to hold him down because Montel is so damn big. Um, but that's not a place that Montel likes to be, and that's probably where Ronnie's going to want to take it. So if he can get it there, 
it starts to get a little bit greasy. You know, you're saying minus 500 is interesting, but then you bring yourself back to reality and you realize Ronnie Yaya is 38 years old. Yeah. Could be his retirement fight. Who, who knows? Uh, Montel Jackson's entering his prime. He's a massive dude. And he's had a lot of success as of recently. Just beat Julio Arce, who, who's no slouch. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, you know, beat him pretty decisively as well. So I'll take Montel for the pick, um, but I don't don't love the price. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Obviously, you never love a minus 500 price, but, you know, look at it and it's like, damn, um, the path to victory is there. It, can Ronnie Yaya implement it? Uh, I don't think so. We'll see. But if he does come back to this, I say I told you so. <laughs> Featherweight bout, Carol Rosa, Norma Dumont. Minus 110 for Norma, plus 110 for Carol Rosa. Over under, two and a half rounds. Minus 310 for the over, plus 310 for the under. We're going up to 145 for Carol Rosa. Big Norm, Norma Dumont, sitting at minus 110. Four and one in her last five. Carol Rosa, four and one in her last five as well. Uh, we know Rosa was at 135 for a bit, and she's going back up to 145. I don't know if that's going to be you know, a permanent move for her. Maybe there's a bit more of a title picture there for her because there's really nobody at 145. So maybe she's looking at that like, yeah, I could, I could maybe take this. Um, and she's taking on Norma Dumont, who has always struggled to make the, the 135. She's trying to get more people up to 145. She just beat Danielle Wolf by decision. She was a minus 400 favorite in that one. And Danielle Wolf, that was her second professional MMA fight. So there's really not much to go off of for the 145 division in women's UFC. But I got to look at this one. Like Carol Rosa is probably a little bit more tested. Um, and she probably has a little bit more skills. And, better striker, in my opinion. Yeah, better striker. Honestly, um, Norma didn't look bad against Danielle Wolf, who is you know, a boxer. Uh, but yeah, more tested in, in MMA striking. I think she's a little bit more tested. She lo- looks a little bit better. <sighs> but uh, fucking a man, like <laughs> this is so so greasy because yeah, Norma. She just literally she has nobody to fight. Like, I don't know. She's literally headlined a main event like <laughs> two two less than two years ago against Aspen Lat. <laughs> like, what is this 145 women's division? It's yeah. it's honestly a joke. Like that shouldn't even be a division. Like, there's not even enough people to make a, a top 10. Like, you can't even make a top 10 because they're all there. Uh just just a weird, weird fight. Um women's MMA. Honestly, I Carol Rose is the dog. I kind of like it. I kinda, yeah, I do too. Yeah. So um, we'll see if we get there, but I'll take her for the sake of the pick. Sorry, big norm, but just got to say, you don't really fight anybody. So yeah, I'll take Carol Rosa. What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, she, when she fights though, know, Macy chess on, she loses, I know split decision. Um, you know what? Macy had what? Six takedowns in that fight. Um, and then the strikes were pretty close. That's, you know, not a terrible loss, but I mean, beating like Danielle Wolf, who had, well, that was her UFC debut, and she's 40 years old. Um, so it's just like, when are you going to start moving up and fighting up the ladder? I think this is it. I think Carol Rosa should be more skilled on the feet. Uh, Dumont obviously going to be bigger, maybe stronger, but if Carol can keep it on the feet, I think Norma might get pieced up here. And at dog money, I I, I don't mind putting it on Carol Rosa at all, um, especially. Her only loss, Sarah McMahon, got taken down four times. Other than that, though, um, you beat Lena Landsberg, Betch Correa, <clears throat> Jocelyn Edwards, who just stole the win the other night, um, and then kind of fought some nobodies from there. But skill for skill, I think Carol Rosa is probably the play. She has higher output. Um, you know, her striking defense can be a little suspect at times. She does get hit, but I, I just think the volume goes to her. If she keeps it on the feet, I. I think she does edge out the win, but I think the bet of the card on this this whole entire card could be for this fight to go to split decision. I think you're, I think you're looking at a, a pricey tag, maybe plus 250, plus 300, and you cash that thing because I think they go back and forth a little bit. I think you know with the way judging's been, um, 
you know, even if Norma gets some takedowns, you know, Carroll's going to land some shots. So it just depends how they score it from judge to judge. I think you get a split decision here. Yeah. Uh, I can't help but think like maybe there's some value on the under two and a half because that's plus 300 for yeah. two chicks that are one plus or 145. You know, you get higher up in weight. There's a little bit more finishes. Both chicks got a lot of decisions under their record. So maybe there's some value on that under two and a half. Uh, but chalky, chalky over. I, I don't yeah. like those chalky overs. Like people could get hurt. You know, like there's always oh, yeah. something crazy could happen. It's MMA. So, yep. End up in a guillotine, something weird. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'll take Rosa for the pick and uh, maybe sprinkle on that split decision. Heavyweight bout, Muhammad Usman coming in at plus 100. Junior Tafa, not uh, Justin Tafa. This is Junior Tafa making his debut at plus 100. Over under one and a half rounds, minus 105 for the over, plus 105 for the under. The undefeated Australian, 4 0, coming in against the 30. Four-year-old Muhammad Usman, the ultimate fighter winner, eight and two in his uh, professional record, just knocked out Zach Palga in the Ultimate Fighter Championship. Uh, honestly, just kind of like an athlete, man. He's six-two. Mm -hmm. You look at him; he's, he's ju juiced up, man. He, he he looks like he's a a muscle. He's he's like a thick muscle six-two. I mean, he's heavyweight. Last weight in at two thirty-six and a half. Uh, honestly, the skills aren't like off the charts. <laughs> he's just an athlete. You watch him him fight, and he's gonna use that speed, that power, that athleticism to win fights. And that's kind of what he did against Zach Palga. Palga was, you know, piecing him up from the outside first round, and then caught him in the second round and put him out flat on his back. Junior Tafa. <laughs> I don't even know what to think about this guy. Like. You look at his brother Justin Taffa, who is you no know, pretty thick heavyweight, uh, not the tallest guy, and he holds a lot of power. And then you look at Junior Taffa, six foot three, and he's kind of weighed in like all over the charts. I've watched a couple of his fights, and in some fights he looks every bit of two sixty five, and in some fights you know, he weighs in at at two oh five. So I'm curious to see how he looks in this one. Like he's fought at 231, 265, 205. He's fought in Muay Thai. He's fought in kickboxing. He's fought in a bunch of different stuff. And he's coming into MMA 4-0, four finishes. So we'll see what he looks like. Um, but for this one, it's it's pretty greasy. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it as the week goes on. But for the sake of the show... I'm going to go with Muhammad Usman at this point. What do you think? I, I think you kind of have to just because, you know, of the little we've seen of Tafa. I mean, Muhammad Usman, that short check hook he hit Zach Palga with was, I mean, it didn't even look like he tried to, to hit him with anything crazy there, and it, it put the lights out. He's huge. He's strong. He can be aggressive. He can kind of be a little timid, though. I mean, if he's going to sit and strike, um, he looks – a little hesitant. I mean, he's obviously low volume um, from what we've seen so far, but when he lands, man, he's got power. And I think that wrestling is going to be key here. If he can implement that, I think he's going to want to against Junior Tafa. I mean, that's the path to victory. A big, strong guy. He's going to be more powerful. Um, just go in, get a takedown, get the job done, beat him up on the ground, kind of take that pop out of Junior Tafa's hands early, um, wear him out a little bit because for how big Muhammad Usman is and how jacked he is, he's got pretty damn good cardio. And I think that comes from his wrestling background. Um, so that's what he's got to do here, man. I think he's got to get it to the ground, wear Junior Taffa out. Taffa making his UFC debut. Um, sometimes those guys gas after the first round, round and a half. If it happens here, it's going to be a long night for him because it'll be hard to keep Muhammad Usman off him. But yeah, I think Usman for the pick for me too here. I like it. Featherweight about Francis Marshall coming in at minus 195. William Gomi, Gomi, I think it's Gomi, plus 195. Over under two and a half rounds, minus 140 for the over, plus 140 for the under. Both guys coming in for their second fight in the UFC. Francis Marshall undefeated. William Gomi, 11 and 2 out of France. What do you like in this one? I like Gomi here. Uh, 
it's hard to get a re- you look at his stats here okay and he's got three takedown in his first ufc fight 100 percent takedown defense um but i mean francis marshall has some decent wrestling in his back pocket i was at francis marshall's last fight in orlando uh, where he got his first knockout in his pro career uh, he's not known for his hands and he's not known for the striking he's got some pretty decent grappling but i from what i've seen in the athleticism of william gomi if he can keep this thing on the feet, I think. I think he's going to be stronger than Marshall, especially as the fight goes on. And on the feet, I just I just worry Francis Marshall maybe has fallen in love with that striking or that thinks he has a lot of power now because he's coming off that knockout against Rojos. And if he does that and he thinks he is you know capable of standing and, and striking with William Gomes, maybe it works for the first round. But as it goes on, I think Gomes would take over on the feet and maybe even find that power shot of it for himself. Um, so, yeah, man, I... Francis Marshall's tempting, maybe a parlay piece, but you look deeper into it, and Gomez is plus 180. I think there's tremendous value there, and I think Vegas thinks the same way. I mean, 85% of the money is on Francis Marshall in this one. You got Gomi at plus 180. Not a lot of people betting on that side yet. Um, those are the you know kind of the sleeper picks that a lot of times end up coming becoming winners. So um, I think it's dog or pass. I don't think you can base Francis Marshall being a minus 210 or minus whatever he is, close to two to one. I don't think you can base that off of his last performance over Rojos. Uh, so, yeah, man, I'm going to stick with the dog here. I think I, I think he gets it done. I think he's got a lot better shot to get it done than what the odds are leaving on. Yeah, I'm with you on the value. I think there's a lot of value on Gomi just because both guys are, are fairly unproven. And I think the styles might match up to where Gomi can – you know, stuff takedowns or get takedowns himself. And if Francis isn't going to push that wrestling himself, maybe falls in love with those hands and it's probably a little bit closer of a fight. Um, but I still think Francis probably gets it done. I think even though he's seven and oh, probably a little bit more overvalued. I'm still going to take him for the sake of the pick on the show uh, for a, a lot of reasons that, that you already touched on. Um, I think he's got a little bit more finishing ability, a little bit more explosiveness. Um, and I think in a smaller cage, he's already fought at the apex when he fought on the contender series. He's used to it. Gomi coming in over from France. I think uh, France is going to be going to be a little bit more uh, accustomed to what's going on there. And I think he can get the win. Um, he's got five, four submission wins under his record as well. So if it goes to the ground, he's dangerous there. And if Gomi takes it to the ground, then uh, the, the submission's always live. So I'll take Francis for the pick. Um, but I, I do see the value on Gomi. Flyway bout Priscilla Cashueta coming in against Karini Silva. Minus 175 for Silva, plus 175 for Cashueta. Over under two and a half rounds, plus 140 for the over, minus 140 for the under. Priscilla Zombie Grill Cashueta, 12 and four, four and one in his, her last five. 34 years old. This girl, I mean, we've always been high on her. We've always been uh, back in the girl, Priscilla Cashueta. We, had, we were on her against. Uh, Sajara Eubanks, and then Eubanks had to cut out with uh, the weight issues. But she beat Ariane Lipsky, knocked her out in the first round, beat Gion Kim, controversial decision, lost to Jillian Robertson, so got subbed in the first round, went for the eye gouge. She's going to fight for your money. That's all we care about. And uh, she's coming in here as a dog. And you know you like the plus money on Priscilla Cashueta because she's going to come to fight. But she's fighting Karini Silva, who is on a tear. And she got a win in the first round of her debut against Pollyanna Battaglio and submitted her in the first round. She got a submission on the Contender Series in the second round. So she's got the submission skills. Seven uh, submissions under her record. And Priscilla Cashueta doesn't like it when it goes to the ground. She's been subbed twice. So she's going to want to stand and bang. Karini Silva's got some pretty good hands as well. But she probably going to look to take this fight to the ground because that's her path of least resistance. And she's got some pretty solid takedowns under, under her uh, her belt. She cracked Patelia with a right hand and then got her to the ground there and then ended up submitting her in her debut. 
And if Cashueta could keep this on the feed, I like her. But that's a big if. What do you think? No, oh, definitely a big if. And, you know, Karini, he's got the two submissions so far in the UFC. And like you alluded to, Cashuera, you know, when it's gotten to the ground, she's been submitted twice, too. So, you know, you look at that, though, and she got submitted by Jillian Robertson, um, who we just saw pull off a beautiful arm bar this past weekend. And the other one's Valentina Shevchenko. So two talented, talented fighters. I mean, Jillian Robertson, at least talented grappler. Um, but on the feet, Priscilla Cashware is going to come forward. She's going to bite down on the mouthpiece and she's going to throw. She might eat some shots, but she is going to give it all she's got. Um, even towards the end of the fight, she's shown that she's got some power. And uh, let's see, did she, her last fight, yeah, she knocked out Ariana Lipsky, which ages pretty well considering Lipsky just went out there as a pretty big underdog against JJ Aldrich and got it done and looked phenomenal on the feet. So I think Cachuera has proved that she can catch anybody. Um, but, I mean, the name of this this whole entire fight is keep it on the feet if you're Priscilla Cachuera because if it goes to the ground, you're going to get in some dangerous positions, especially against a fighter like like Karini. So for the pick, <sighs> I got to keep rocking with Priscilla Cachuera. And, you know, even if you do like her side and you're confident in her, I think you could even play that KO prop because um, I do think she's going to be a lot better on the feet. She's definitely going to be more powerful. And she goes for it. She's like that, that rare women's fighter that on the feet, she's going to go for that knockout, and she's going to throw with all the power she has. Um, so, yeah, I, for the pick, man, I'm going to stick with her. I haven't seen as much out of Karini Silva yet as I'd like to. Obviously, the two submissions so far in the UFC were nice. Um, but this is Priscilla Cachuera, who's fought a lot of good fighters and uh, you know a lot more UFC-level experience than Karina will have. Yeah, I think this is kind of an underrated fight. Like for women's fight, both chicks when they throw, they throw hard. Yeah, and uh, Cachueta, she gets hit a bunch though. I mean, she absorbs damn near eight significant strikes per minute. She only lands four point six eight. Karini Silva does have a negative uh, strike average as, as well, but it's not as pronounced. Two point four nine landed, three point nine five absorbed. So. Both chicks get hit a lot, <laughs> and uh, I would just find it very weird if Karini Silva doesn't look to take this to the ground. Yeah, she just wants to stand and strike with her. Um, well, that isn't isn't to say that Cachueta can't stuff a couple takedowns and make it mm -hmm. interesting. So, yeah, I think yeah. So there's a lot of value on Cachueta. Um, and I'll take her for the pick as well. Got to rock, got to rock with her, you know. Bantamweight about the first fight on the card. Bakari Dana coming in at minus 130. Brady Heastan plus 130. Over under two and a half rounds plus 140 for the over. Minus 140 for the under. Six and two for Brady Heastan. Only 23 years old. Coming off a couple wins against Ricky Tercios and uh, Fernie Garcia. And then Bakari Dana, three and two in his last five. He's on a two fight losing streak which he lost to Chris Gutierrez and Kyung Ho Kong. And he got knocked out against Chris Gutierrez with that spinning back fist. Um, so he was on a three-fight win streak and then just lost his last two. So I think in this one, he, he kind of needs a win. Like he, he's coming off two losses. He's going to be coming in this one very motivated for a win. Maybe his job's on the line. Brady, he's stand young. Showed a lot of promise. He's going to go for those takedowns. He averages 4.5 per 15 minutes. And I watched the fight back with Ricky Tercios. Tercios hasn't really aged too well uh, in the UFC. And uh, I don't know, man. Like, I watched that fight with Tercios. Tercios was hitting him with like a bunch of short shots when he got those takedowns. And he stand, didn't wear the damage very well. Uh, he got knocked down by Tercios, and in my opinion, he got knocked down, damn near knocked down by Fernie Garcia in like the first couple seconds of that fight. Got dropped, um, but was able to come back and win that one, get the takedowns, and uh, a lot of control time. That's what Brady Heastan's going to do. Going to want to get you to the ground, probably throw you up against the cage, get that control time, land some shots from on top. Bakari, very fast striker, lands a bunch of shots. Uh, his real weakness in his last fight was getting kicked in the legs. 
I don't think Brady he stands is going to be kicking the legs too much. I look at this one like if if Bakari can stuff some takedowns, he's got 66% takedown defense. This is a, a really solid fight for him because I think if it's on the feet, he pieces him up. Um, but that's a big if <laughs> in a smaller cage. Uh, I'm going to go with Bakari Dana. I think there's going to be a lot of people on he stand looking at, like most people don't know who Bakari Dana is. And they, they saw Brady he stand on the Ultimate Fighter. A lot of people know him. A lot of people are pretty high on him. He's a, a little bit better record. They look at Dana coming off two losses. Looking at the plus money on Heastan, they're probably going to be really tempted. Um, but I'm going to go with Dana on this one. I think he'll probably land the more damage. And if we looked at you know, a lot of these decisions by the, the judges, they kind of look, they don't really, I mean, if you look at the Pudalova fight last week, like she got the, the ground control. They didn't really reward it. So, you know, maybe you look at this one and say the striker is going to land the more damage. They're not going to give too much of the points to that that ground control, getting those takedowns. So I'll take Bakari Dana. What do you think? You know, the thing that, that stands out to me here is just the damage that he stands taken in some of his last fights against a guy like uh, Dana, who, like you said, is fast. He hits really hard. I mean, he's been kind of KO or get KO'd in, uh, you know, a majority of his fights. He had that three-fight KO streak. Um, so I think he's going to be super dangerous and super live against Heastan for that KO. I mean, Ricky Tercios, not much of a power striker, kind of a volume, has that weird style. And uh, he was able to he was able to get in and uh, hurt Heastan as well there. So if Heastan can't get this thing to the ground against a guy like Dana, who's strong, um, who's explosive, I think it's going to be a long night for him on the feet because that speed and that power, I think, is going to be a level above Brady Heastan here. And, uh, yeah, man, he said, I just haven't seen enough out of him offensively that makes me think he's going to go out there and just steamroll this dude by any means with the grappling or wrestling. So, um, yeah, man, at the end of the day, I'm going to take the power and the speed in this one, especially, you know, a guy in he stand who's just getting started in the UFC that can kind of be the detriment. So yeah, give me, give me the gnaw here. Um, I'll probably lay something on him too in this one. I like it. That's it for the card. As always, those are our early predictions, or our early preview for the card. But if you want to get all of our picks for uh, UFC Vegas 71 and all of our picks in the future, head over to the Double Egg Premium. The link will be down in the description below. You can go for the monthly membership or you can just get our bets for the card. Those are usually available Friday afternoon, Friday night, and available Sunday or Saturday morning uh, all, all the way until the fights are over. So. If you just want to get those, uh, it's a very cheap price for you, $9.99. You can get them uh, in the link there when it's when it's available. But other than that, at the double egg on all the social medias, Instagram and TikTok. If you're watching here on YouTube, drop a subscription down below to support the channel and the boys and uh, drop a like, drop a comment. If you got any plays this weekend, at Hey Jive Picks on the medias for me, where can they find you? On TikTok at the Parlay, Instagram and Twitter, the Parlay underscore media, and on YouTube, the Parlay MMA. All right. Till next time. See you in the next video. Double X, I don't know.